After a controversial and contentious election process, Pakistan has a new government. Former Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif has once again assumed office. He heads an eight-party coalition in a parliament where the single largest party, that's the former PTI, is in the opposition. Now, Sharif has returned to power at a very difficult time. The credibility of his government is extremely low due to allegations of rigging of the February elections. The country's economy is in doldrums and the government has little space to manoeuvre. We go to Abdul for the latest chapter in Pakistan's very difficult journey. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So, finally, a government in Pakistan, but uh, not the most, uh, say, let's say, pleasant to circumstances for the government or the country. Could you maybe take us to the last part of the government formation? Uh, you know, what have been the controversies in recent times? Well, Prashant, after the agreement which was signed between, uh, we can say, which was agreed uh, between the PPP and uh, PMLN uh, Nawaz Sharif, uh, these parties came together uh, along with other smaller parties to basically claim uh, the majority. And on Sunday, there was a voting finally in the parla in the newly elected National Assembly in which Shabazz Sharif got uh, around two hundred one votes uh, in the in the in the in the assembly which has 336 seats so it's a almost a, a well comfortable majority um, uh, his rival omar uh, uh, which was basically uh, kind of uh, put as a candidate uh, as a prime minister candidate by the pti which is now uh, standing in the parliament as sunni Tehat council uh, got only 92 votes, which is exactly the number of uh, seats which uh, Sunni Tihad Council or PTI has at this moment in the National Assembly. So you can say that there, by and large, there is a, a, a the legislatures stuck to their party line and they voted accordingly. Uh, meanwhile, there is one more thing which has uh, interesting happened uh, that. All the reserve seats, uh, there are around 17 reserve seats, uh, 60 for the women and 10 for the minorities in the National Assembly were allotted to uh, uh, national, uh, sorry, PMLN and PPP and other parties and none of them were allotted to the Sunni Tehat Council. ECB in its decision, Election Commission of Pakistan, its in decision on Monday said that uh, uh, Sunni Tehat Council is not eligible for those seats uh, because it did not uh, submit its name prior to the election, the candidates list prior to the election as it is mandated. And it has some legal issues which cannot be resolved at this moment. So, of course, this has been criticized by the opposition and by the legal fraternity in the country. But it seems that this is going to be uh, the status quo at this moment. Um, given the fact uh, that Pakistan, Imran Khan is not uh, uh, in, in, in still in the jail and there is no uh, strong uh, leadership of PTI which is there in the public at this moment, despite the fact that PTI has given national uh, nationwide call for protest, it seems that this is uh, Sabah Sarif is going to uh, kind of form. He has already prime minister, but his cabinet is just to be formed. Uh, so, yeah, that is this is, this is what happened uh, since last we talked about Pakistan. Right. Abhi also, so what are the challenges right now confronting the government of Shahbaz Sharif? Uh, one second, coming back to power, but the situation is quite grim for the country. Well, uh, the issues are quite stark. Of course, uh, everyone knows about the Pakistan's economy being uh, the worst at this moment uh, in its history. Uh, and it is seeking yet another loan from the IMF. The, the last installment of the previous $3 billion loan was, of course, given a uh, uh, few days back. But uh, that is not enough. For Pakistan, apparently, for Pakistan uh, to kind of uh, uh, survive, uh, kind of come back and uh, kind of revive its economy. And Shahbaz Sharif, while taking uh, charge as prime minister, announced that his government will seek yet another loan. Uh, that would mean that the suffering of the Pakistanis will be even more in the coming days because the conditionalities of the IMF loan we all know about. The last loan itself created a lot of problems of uh, uh, subsidies uh, being withdrawn, uh, social security being withdrawn, and, and, and the prices of the uh, essential commodities going high. So it seems that the economic, on the economic uh, front, which is the most important problem any Pakistani government uh, faces and Shabash Sharif will face, is going, there is no hope at this moment 
given the fact that Shabash Sharif was the prime was prime minister when Pakistan economy was basically uh, uh, had these problems uh, in the initial stage. So it seems that this is going to be one major challenge. Other, other of course, is security. On the front, security front, there is uh, widespread, uh, you can say, violence or all across the country, particularly in provinces like Balochistan and in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which is going to be intensified, it seems, given the fact that there is no uh, uh, concrete measure as if now announced. Uh, there are another uh, set of issues which is... Uh, See, Pakistan is yet to emerge from the impact of the floods it suffered in a uh, few years back. There are there is another uh, 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 smaller, but there is uh, uh, there are reports coming that there is a heavy rain in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and there are local floods uh, in that region. And these are the reasons which are all already worst affected because of the violence, because of the bad economic condition, and so on and so forth. So this is one. But the most uh, pressing issue at this moment would be the political uh, issue: how, how to resolve this, uh, the crisis of legitimacy which the current uh, Shabazz Shabazz government is facing, not only because of the uh, allegations made by PTI and other op smaller opposition parties of the elections being rigged, but also uh, uh, because of the instability which is there all across the country at this moment, pr primarily because of the lack of confidence in the ruling establishment in the and the way uh, it seems it has become a wide, widespread knowledge that the uh, Pakistan army has tightly uh, taken control over both the elections and the formation of go new government. And that would create a lot of problems for Pakistan in the coming days. And how Shabar Sharif government is dealing with it, how it addresses it, uh, is to be seen. Thank you so much, Abdul, for that update. Donald Trump and Joe Biden have moved closer to clinching the nominations for their parties after the Super Tuesday round of primaries in multiple states. Trump and Biden won hands down with Trump emerging the victor or leading in all states except Vermont, which was won by his last remaining opponent, Nikki Haley. Biden too has pretty much wrapped up the Democratic race. Let's go to Anish to see what the results say and what lies ahead. Anish, it is a bit of a foregone conclusion, but nonetheless, could you maybe take us through what the very broadly the results of the Super Tuesday primaries are? Of course, the final results are not entirely out yet, but nonetheless, the trends are pretty clear. Yeah, so what we're looking at is a pretty much a sweep by Donald Trump in almost all the states except for Vermont. Uh, rest of the states that have gone uh, into the pr Republican primaries, at least, uh, has been swept by uh, Trump. And even in the Democratic camp, uh, where there was the only contest is basically uh, Williamson, Marianne Williamson, uh, pretty much was also uh, swept over. Uh, but in both cases, uh, what we're looking at is a very clear indication that the next election is going to be again a Trump versus Biden election. And, you know, that is going to have its own set of problems. Uh, we can get into that a little shortly, but uh, it, there are some significant trends here, uh, especially in the Democratic camp, primarily because we also talked about uh, in our copies and our articles before about how a large growing number of Democrats are now voting undecided or, uh, you know, none of the above. Uh, this in the Republican camp usually uh, only happened uh, in favor of Trump wherever he was, uh, you know, uh, not allowed to uh, stand on the primary ballot. Uh, obviously, that has been taken out. Now he could actually stand for anywhere. Uh, but uh, in the case of uh, the Democratic Party, this clearly shows a disillusionment uh, against Biden, growing amount of disillusionment. And that is uh, something that cannot be wished away at this point. We are still at early results, but the numbers are still quite large. In some states, uh, the Democrats are polling 19% for undecided or, you know, uh, no preference. And that is, uh, that's a huge number of Democratic voters, mem card holding members, uh, refusing to support uh, the president, even if effectively he's the only one on the ballot. So that clearly shows that there is a significant uh, disillusionment within the Democratic Party against uh, President Biden. 
And this has a large part to do with obviously his recent foreign, uh, you know, foreign affairs overtures, but also, uh, you know, the, his failure at the domestic front on many instances. Uh, in another way, if you look at it, this is this is no longer the polarizing uh, election that we're looking at, because the fact that a large number of people are ready to, you know, vote whatever third party comes to mind, if if there is a if there's a strong uh, third party candidate, clearly shows, or the fact that they do not want to be tied down by their uh, party affiliations, clearly shows that uh, this the upcoming elections would be much more complex than we have seen in recent memory. Anish, could you elaborate a bit more on the kind of challenges Biden is facing? Uh, on the one hand, of course, he's had one of the smoothest runs to uh, candidacy in recent times. Uh, on the other hand, there seems to be a huge amount of disenchantment with him from various sections of his coalition. Well, the smooth run is not uh, unsurprising. It's always been a sort of a tradition among, uh, you know, incumbent parties uh, or incumbent ruling parties uh, to not uh, put up candidates or any formidable candidates at the very least against a sitting president of their own party. So it's not unusual in that term. And the kind of candidates that have been put on, like Williamson is not somebody who's quite popular, even though she might have some, you know, eccentric and also some in some ways uh you know progressive uh, uh stand on several policy issues uh she is not somebody who's popular at all so he is obviously having a smooth run he's actually pulling much higher than trump if you look at the margins uh 70 percent 80 percent is like the minimum at the very least but the fact that there is a significant opposition within the Democratic camp uh, against Biden is primarily due to the fact that this is a presidency that has been marked by complete inaction like this. And it is not just President Biden. It's also the Democratic Party leadership, even when they held the Congress, both the houses, a majority, uh, when they had it, they were the most ineffective ruling party the U.S. could see in recent times. And that is something, and especially on various, a whole range of issues, be it Medicare for all, be it on uh, matters of demilitarizing or bringing down military expenditure or, you know, cutting down on foreign wars, support for Israel, uh, or, you know, actually uh, bringing about changes in immigration laws that can actually help uh, asylum seekers undo the kind of damages that Trump had affected, a whole host of issues that the Biden administration effectively failed on actually making things happen, things that they promised, things that they promised in their campaign trail, they failed to make it happen. And that is something uh, that is creating a significant challenge for the Democrats in the upcoming election. It's, it's a very disillusioned ele election process also. If you look at the fact that a large number of people are ready to vote nobody rather than vote somebody, uh, that they are not uh, beholden to the, the Tina doctrine, that there is no alternative. They do not look at it like that. They want an alternative. They're demanding an alternative. And that uh, the lack of it is uh, is creating a big... I mean, it can become a bigger problem, a bigger trouble, because... You know, if you if your Democratic voter turnout is going to fall down because the kind of candidates being put up is not good uh, in a marginal election, in a very you know narrow polarized election, it is going to be a big setback for you. And that is something that the Democratic leadership is really not ready to confront at this current point in time. Right, Anish. And finally, what about Trump? Uh, of course, uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a challenge inside his party, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, will he face any legal obstacles or have they been cleared as well? Well, it's not that he is completely cleared of his legal obstacles. Obviously, he is still facing, uh, you know, uh, charges uh, for tax fraud. He's faced already a conviction. He's already has a conviction, which is going to have a big impact on his uh, campaign uh, funding, to be honest. Uh even the immunity process, uh, the fact that the Supreme Court overruled uh, putting up uh, Trump uh, you know, or banning Trump from, uh, you know, primary ballots does not mean that there won't be any challenge when it comes to actual nomination from the party with an actual election, because these are still party elections. These are internal party elections and primary ballots. 
may uh, may show that uh, trump has significant I and mean, very unanimous support within nearly unanimous support within the republican party it does not uh, tell you how uh, whether it has a, it means that trump can actually translate that support outside of the party as well and whether uh, you know a court even if it's a conservative court would have a, would would be forced would not be forced to have a different ruling when it comes to challenging, uh, you know, his nomination as the president, uh, so these factors can also be uh, come into play. Uh, there, there was definitely a setback, and it was an expected ruling as well, since we are looking at a conservative supermajority. They will always find ways and means to support him, considering that most of them are also, uh, you know, Trump appointees as well. So that is there, but you do not, you still have legal challenges and there will be legal impediments. And even if they cannot prevent Trump from, uh, you know, running the office, they can at least affect his uh, campaign finances, which are significantly crucial in the U.S. elections. Millions of dollars, if they are not going to come in from you, then you have to find ways to uh, make raise that money. And if you are not going to raise that money, it is going to be significantly difficult for you to win an election, no matter how easy it is. So these are factors that are going to obviously affect his campaign as well. So challenges are there for Trump as well. It is not like he's completely scot-free. It is going to be a different kind of challenges than what Biden is obviously facing, which is obviously the f complete inaction under his uh, four years of presidency. Right. Not to mention the constant chance of genocide Georgia that are chasing him everywhere. Thank you so much, Anisha, for the update. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.